Okay, good evening. Um, welcome along to our, our Blether With series. Uh, we're just waiting for Gordon uh, Dallas to join us. Um, we had a little bit of a technical issue to start with, so we've had to shut everything down um, and restart the show just to uh, to get everything uh, corrected and live again. So apologies if you were looking out for the chat. Um, some of you may have seen it on our Highland Academy page um, going live. So there will be um, a chat with uh, recording uh, as soon as he links on to us. Uh, so just to give you a little uh, insight into why we do this, um, the, these chats, um, it's not for kind of self-promotion. It's not for selling anything. It's basically just to give you guys an insight into who we are at Inverurda Whiskey Shop uh, and who we, we kind of deal with on a day-to-day -day basis and who we kind of plan to do um, appearances with uh, or who you may view um, and, and see on your, your kind of whiskey experience. So last week we had uh, a local independent bottler, uh, Andrew Smith from Little Brown Dogs, um, who is also a gin distiller. And um, the week before, myself and Russell from the shop had a, a wee chat just about the shop itself. Uh, so, so quite laid back, as you can see, I'm, I'm sitting in my, my own living room um, with, with a wee dram. Uh, and you know, Gordon's at his house, he's actually on holiday this week, uh, which he he, uh, he jumped at the chance to chat with us because it gets him out of the painting um, uh, that his wife has got scheduled for him. So um, next week we have... Um, Charlie Chamonix, who uh, is one of our guests from Norway, who we've been introduced to through Zoom. Um, and for those of you who've been on our, uh, or any kind of <laughs> tasting events virtually, will probably have met Charlie before. Um, so she's coming on um, next week. So um, we, um, yeah, we're, we're looking forward to speaking to a host of, of guests uh, over the next few weeks. Normally, Russell uh, from the shop will be here um, with us as well, but um, he he can't make it tonight. So it's not always just me. Um, so do give us a um, come back. If, if I bore you, come back next week and uh, surely Russell um, won't be boring you. Um, so we're just making sure that... Um, Gordon is is logging on. Um, he is all set up. We just had to uh, reconnect the the broadcast um, due to some technical issues, as I'm sure uh, you think we'd all be geniuses in, in Zoom and Facebook Live experts and all that. We've been doing it for so long. Uh, unfortunately, some things do crop up that uh, can be out with our control. Um, but... Uh, uh, yeah, these things happen. We're, we're not going out to the pubs tonight. We're not running away to do anything. So quite happy uh, just to sit here. Uh, I just noticed on the, the chat there, we've got Douglas Wiley, um, who is kind of my first contact with uh, Glen Goyne uh, Distillery and, and uh, Tam Dew. Douglas has done a lot of work for us behind the scenes. So hello, Douglas. Um, good to see you uh, joining us. And um, yeah, so... <laughs> Trying to fill in some time here just until Gordon gets his uh, his technical aspects up and running. Hopefully it won't be too long now. Uh, we are actually um, doing a, a, a Zoom uh, tasting with... Uh, Gordon again uh, and some uh, Glen Goyne we had last week uh, last month we'd done a Tam Dew tasting um, quite a um, special Tam Dew by the launch of the brand new 10 year old which is a very limited uh, whiskey uh, we managed to get that in uh, and the guys who were involved in the tasting had the opportunity to buy um, so that went down really well um, an absolutely stunning drum the dregs of which um, I've actually got in my hand here and so I'm, I'm delighted to say that I can now stop treading water. Um, Gordon is, is here with us. Um, yeah. That wasn't difficult. That wasn't difficult at all, Mike. <laughs> you can say, you know, they think we'd all be experts at this by now. Um, yeah. That's over a year we'd be doing this. But uh, these things happen. Um, yeah. And I've already seen a boost in numbers already, Gordon. So just your, your sheer presence. <laughs> so I've added one. So there we go. 
So, yeah, so this is actually the uh, the drama. I was just saying there is, is the ten year old Tam Do that got launched uh, last year, uh, last month. Um, oh is, yes, this is the 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 last of the the cast. We so we had it all sent out to to the guys who were on the virtual tasting and um, managed to keep a little bit um, for an occasion such as this. So. So, Slandrian, well, thank you very much for coming along. And, not um, at all. I'm delighted to be here. As I said to you, it's um, up technically in holiday and there's DIY hell going on up there. I'm at the bottom of my garden. And quite frankly, when you invited me, it's like, I'm there. So, yeah. <laughs> door's locked. <laughs> got the whiskey. <laughs> so, right, we've got, uh, so uh, Douglas um, Wiley is, is on. Uh, he's watching, saying hello. Um yeah, Douglas, it's, it's a, a great point. Uh, we have the Glengoyne tasting on election day. So we might be celebrating something. We might be commiserating something. But we can do it with a whiskey, which is correct. Great. <laughs> One thing we can guarantee we'll all be drinking, regardless of who you're supporting. So that will be, oh, we'll have to have an election theme that night. I think there'll have to be some, we'll have to be yeah. voting for our best, something like that. We'll have to do a vote, yeah. Um, so Duncan, um, good to see you, Duncan. He's uh, Duncan's one of our regular. Uh, viewers uh, and purchasers from the shop, uh, we just sent him a couple of nice bottles up of, of uh, the little brown dog uh, who we spoke to last week in our wee blather. Uh, so Andrew Smith, um, I think they've got some really exciting stuff. They're going to be quite a, a name to look out for. Uh, I so, will. I'll so, look out for that. Yeah. So, so Gordon, this is actually the first time we've, we've spoken. Um, yeah. You know, I have done Glengoyne uh, Distillery Tour, but I don't think it was yourself who, who took us. Um, so you would have remembered. You would have remembered. <laughs> yeah. um, so Glengoyne actually um, has a wee special place um, for for oh, me. Yes. We we got uh, my uh, we got engaged at Ard Garten, um, not too far down the road oh. from you, um, and on the way into Stirling to to buy the wedding ring, or the, the engagement ring because I, I wasn't going to fork out money on that if she said no. So we, we did the engagement thing. She said uh, very wise. <laughs> yes, she said, I suppose so. So how romantic was that? You know, beautiful hills, sitting in a span, in the back of a log cabin. And she said, yeah, I suppose so. Yeah. So we're on the way to... No, no, no. Where's the honeymoon? Yeah. <laughs> They'll get more excited. <laughs> well, 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 the honeymoon due, uh, due to the COVID, we, we, we spent three three nights in Lossiemouth. Uh, was the oh, right. right. Oh, this is recent. Right. Oh, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Congratulations. Just, uh, so we got the, the bottle. Um, we... On the way to Stirling, we um, uh, to buy the ring. We, we stopped off at Glengoyne. Uh, we did the tour, and uh, we we filled this on the day we got engaged. So we opened it at, at the wedding. Um, so it was the fifteenth of January two thousand nineteen. So yeah, just two years ago. Um, so this is the eleven year old, hand, uh, not quite eleven, a ten year old handful. So I'll pour that a little bit later on. So, yeah, we've always had a nice wee affinity with Glenn and, and do, do you know what, Mike? I remember taking a couple around. I think they were from either Australia or New Zealand, and they had been married something like 20 years. And on, on their anniversary, they took a little sip out of, I think it was also a hand-filled bottle they did 20 years earlier. And, and, and finally, the bottle had emptied, and they were back at Glen going to fill up the bottle to take it back and celebrate their anniversary all over again. It's pretty, right. These stories are fantastic. But we'll have to come down and fill the bottle because, as you see, it's 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 almost done. Um, yes, most impressive, you know, sixty point two percent. And it, is uh, that it looks like a European sherry cask you've got there as yeah. well. And I think the official you have tanned that is the official terminology. Is that right? Yeah. We, we had to share it um, with, with, with the guests. We only we were lucky enough. We only had to invite twelve people, uh, or sorry, we were only allowed to invite twelve. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> in, a, in a way, expense wise, it was it was great, but. Um, my, my wife works at Glengarry, um, so she, she's oh, in, yes. the, in the whiskey um, as well. Um, more of a kind of Isla fan. But what um, what were the comments of the night was my dad um, was sitting in the in the crowd and he's watching it. So we poured the 60.2% uh, and Tony took a swig of it and didn't even blink, just scoofed it. And my dad was like, <laughs> yeah, she, 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 she'll fit right in. So <laughs> it's it was... Uh, really, <laughs> that's really good. I know it's... Yeah. I, I think the Glengoyne, that strength, it, it really doesn't feel like it. I know she's probably a very good drinker, she can handle it, but but it doesn't really feel at sixty point two percent. I'm looking at I've seen that. Mike, I was, uh, again I took I used to be a tour guide at Glengoyne. I remember speaking to a big crowd of people just outside the stillhouse and I was talking exactly that point. Glengoyne, high strength, doesn't really taste like it. I said it's like 
you know, if you go abroad and you have some of those oozos, uh, you know, they're about 30, 7, 30, take your mouth off. Could you imagine that at 60%? And this big guy says, hey, I make ouzo. I'm from Greece. <laughs> Turned out he's quite a big ouzo product producer. I was like, not, not your ouzo. Not your ouzo. The cheaper stuff. So, but yeah, Glen, Glen Goyne is, uh, it really is quite smooth at that, that strength as well. Yeah, I'm looking forward to pouring it again because I haven't had it since, can't remember I had it the day after. Uh, well, we did, we took because some of my family couldn't go. So we poured a dram for my, my brothers and that the day after. Um, so I've had, but I haven't had it since. So I'm looking forward to pouring that a little bit later on. Um, so Alistair Gray, one of the guys you just mentioned, he loves the teapot drum. We were torn between teapot and this, but I thought the fact that we get to the hand label it and put our name on it, um, that will make it a little bit extra special. So yeah, I completely agree with Alistair. The teapots are amazing. Yeah, it's great. It's great fun as well. It's just a great, you know. I, I really think John Glass is a master blender. I think. He's in his element trying to create the new teapot. You know, you've got about five single casks. You, you he requests them, and then you know just just throw them in there with no filter, no water. And bang! You've got you've got a you've got the teapot from yesteryear. It's it's amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so so yeah. Um, I mean, we we want to talk about Glen Gordon. We want to talk about Tam too. But we want to get you know, the idea of of these blethers is more to to sort of introduce people. Our viewers into people who they will meet throughout their whiskey experience. So, so people will have met you or, or heard you and been on a tour with you or listened to you in some of your various um, other kind of lives of, of sport and and whiskey and BBC and comedy and the friend fit. Yeah, it's <laughs> so, so. We want to know about Gordon. We want to know what what makes Gordon tick. What you know? What do you what do you enjoy doing? What you know, what got you into whiskey? Um, has whiskey always been there? That, that's the first question. Has it always been part of, of you? Yeah, I, was, I think you, you have to say yes. Uh, not to the extent it is now. I was mm. just a very happy imbiber and, you know, probably going to shops like your own and having a nice little uh, dram or two, but not 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 really um, like some people that started their careers in the industry. I went round the houses before I came to whiskey, but I enjoyed it as a, as a consumer on the other side of the fence, you know? <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, yeah, um, I was probably a little bit different, but I started working in the trade and got introduced to whiskey through that. So right. a little bit yes. different. To, you know, to, so you're, you're classed, I think you're the first person or, or the only person I know of being called a whiskey experiential ambassador. What all they can that? give me, that's right. That's really all, they just got some vowels and consonants. <laughs> Threw them together to give give them that job, you know. So that's, that's, the that's what you picked out. <laughs> <laughs> there's a P, there's an X. What can we give this guy? Um, <laughs> yes, let's say I think that's now just over three years of the experiential ambassador, and uh, I suppose you'll know as well. It's difficult now to sell to anything to anyone really. With this is cheap, buy it or or. You know, you need this in your life. You, it's just a, a recognition, I think, of you've got to have a bit of story. You've got to have something else nowadays. People are too savvy. They want to know a lot more about the, the, the commodity that they're purchasing. It doesn't need to be whiskey. So experiential is just another word for stories and a bit of depth and background and giving it giving it more um, dimension to do to the to the product. So couple of things, Mike. The, the, the first thing I was I was asked to do was to delve into the Glengoyne archives and come up with a, 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 the Glengoyne story tour, which is the first new tour we've done in about 10 years at Glengoyne. So it took about five, six, seven months to research, then just place it together um, and then present it to Stuart Henry, who's been there for over 20 years, who's now been recently awarded Visitor Attraction manager of the year with the whiskey awards so a big accolade so Stuart's Mr Glenn Goyne and um, he battered it around the room with me and that was really to create the storytelling tour which we launched in January it must have been the same month as your wedding we launched it in January of 2019 mm -hmm. uh, sorry 2020 and then the pandemic it fell it yeah. fell us in March so we got like three or four live uh, runs at it before it had to close down so it's in the in the wings 
and it brings together a uh, tasting whiskey. There's a little bit of, you know, visuals as well. And I, I like to put on a little, you know, little top hats and we've got some business cards that we, we hand out and we not just talk about it, but try and inhabit some of the people that have shaped the Glengoyne liquid and the Glengoyne story. So, so is it kind of fun. tying in with the, the Legacy series as well then? Because that, that's all about the history of it and, and that's the, the that, of the gang, yeah. yeah, that's exactly it. In fact, Legacy 1 was the third dram on the tour. It was a five-whiskey tour um, and it was the first time I've done a tour but it's not a tour. You, you go up to the boardroom and it's a, it's a, it's a flavour tour and a, and a historical tour from before 1833 to the present day and you drink the clear liquids um, that's how I wanted to do it because the story starts in the hills behind the distillery where you were in the campsies that's where the story starts over two three hundred years ago with the guys making it illegally so we wanted to talk about these guys where the actual knowledge came from but we wanted to taste it so I had to ask Robbie Hughes could we get the new mate don't Unless you come and do a masterclass, which is five hours long, you don't get a taste of the new make on any of the tours uh, okay. at Glen Glen. So, or now experiences, I should say, what now we're calling them. And um, yeah, it said yes. So this starts. This experience starts with the the new make spirit, which would have been the the the, the stuff that they sold and tried to get into Glasgow two three hundred years ago, and it goes right the way through a uh, legacy series one, right up to twenty one in teapot. As well, so it's a it's a wonderful exploration of the flavour journey of Glengoyne, and there's a lot of historical characters you'll meet in there, and that's a storytelling experience. And that was my first gig at this experiential ambassador, how to create a tour and bring it to life. So that's that's a wee flavour. I'm hoping when it all goes back to normal, we can get that on the touch wood in that agenda. Correct. Yeah, that's uh looking forward. Yeah, looking forward to go back. And not only is it a beautiful part of the country, but yeah. What, what more reasons you need to travel than to get, to get a good tour and a good dram? Uh, it's, yeah. So, so yeah, I mean, talking about the history, so Glengoyne sits right on the, the Highland border line, doesn't it? You've, you've got dis, distilled in the Highlands, matured in the Lowlands. Is that right or is it the other way around? No, no, it's, that's, that's correct. That's the great, uh, the great Google fact. If you look at the sort of fun facts, Glengoyne, boom. And that we, we, we do approach that at the... The storytelling experience because a lot of the, the distillery ambassadors mentioned that but I just wanted to actually get right into why that is the case why is effectively the warehouseman in the lowlands in the highland mm -hmm. the, the, the stillmen are effectively highlanders <laughs> I used to joke it was about a 10 foot wall that separated them you know and on a Friday it was load up with a whiskey and let's get into it but yes that's the um, Wash Act of 1784 established mm. the first boundary, the first line, the geographical Highland Lowland line is about 20 miles north uh, yeah. around about Aberfoyle. But this line came from the Firth of Clyde to the Firth of Tay. And it just snaked its way around all the roads and it divided Scotland into the Lowlands and the Highlands. Mm. And the poor farmers, because there was no distillery in those days, the uh, the guys in the hills of the counties were on the wrong side of the line. It's almost like the Berlin Wall when it went up. You were right on the east or the west. You were yeah. on the wrong side of that wall. And it was the same with this line. If you're in the campsies, you now no longer could sell your whiskey to Glasgow. You're now you're able to apply for a licence, but only for personal consumption. And if you were on the other side of the line, which was the south side, um, you could apply for an export licence, get it to London and make money. So that's round about when we start this story stilling experience, asking you... What do you think the guys from Balfron, from Calerne, from the Campsies, from Torrance, what do you think they did? You know, give up. You know, well, let's make something else. You know, let's make some tartan piper dolls that will sell in Glasgow or some scarves. Or did they say, sod you, we're going to do it by the light of the moon and we're going to do it even more and, and get it to Glasgow um, by hook or by crook. And that's yeah. where we really start the whole experience. Brilliant. Sounds like that, yeah. To, to live in that kind of, you know, live in the day would have been great. Um, I'm not sure if the oh. whiskey would have been as good as we get now, but I'm sure the, uh, the experience. Oh, yeah. I mean, it would have been clear the moonshine, you know. Yeah. And um, I told, we did a, 
we sort of little show um, when Janet Lumley came to, to visit during lockdown in between and they were interested in her production company wanted to hear more about these smuggling and it was mostly ladies of the local parish that would be um, loaded up with here's one we get made and this is what we get made for the tour here's a almost a world premiere this is made by a company in England that specialise in movie props for historical dramas and this yeah. is a, a leather bound smuggling pouch um, hand stitched and uh, wax sealed closest that we think that would have been put on the waists of the local ladies and then the hoop, the skirts would go around there and they would walk 14 miles from the Campsie area to Glasgow load the um, barman's trough with the moonshine, take the money then walk 14 miles back that's the best part of a marathon, amazing and um, John Lumley had this her production company wanted to come, they filmed it which you can all watch on the ITV player if you want to watch her recent show. But the reason I'm saying this, on the back of that, a local historian contacted the distillery and said, I've done a lot of research into the smuggling routes from your part of the, the world into Glasgow. So he sent me a lovely, big, massive, big um, email. And we have the correspondence. I'm going to be meeting him up once it's all uh, able, we're able to do so. But yes, there was a Garth's Cube hike road that went from George Square to Drimmon and of course each part of the road was a was a turnpike so you had to pay to get on each part of the road and the yeah. policing started to get less and less as you moved out of Glasgow so <laughs> I went right out to um, from George Square up to Port Dundas to, to Mary Hill uh, uh, right up um, past uh, what's now the Science Park at Mary Hill on to Mulgay then further up and the smugglers would use that road, um, wouldn't pay the pike toll at night. Uh, but there was an, an 1816, he sent me a little clipping from the Glasgow Herald. Um, eight smugglers, uh, all their names uh, from Calerne and from Drimmon, met eight excise men. In fact, it was four excise men and four hired hands. You could hire muscle in those days, uh, yeah. big thugs. Uh, they were hiding. Now, we think it's just where the, if you know Glasgow, it's just where the fire station is in Mary Hill Road. So they were coming down the road, jumped onto the Fourth and Clyde Canal. The other get to, they met the excise men. We think it'd be two in the morning, and there was an absolute barney, fisticuffs, eh, cudgels. Um, but one of the excise men's hired hands shot dead eh, one of the smugglers, who was a farmer, eh, and he died in his brother's arms. And one of the other smugglers got stabbed in the thigh, they got rushed to the hospital. It turns out the excise men, all eight of them, were tried for murder at the High Court in Edinburgh under the judge Lord Boyle. So it was a huge case at the time. This wasn't done. Smuggling was kind of seen as a, you know, a bit naughty, but, you know, yeah. not, don't, there was no murder involved. And that's how seriously the judiciary took it and the public were up in arms. But the guy, the excise men get let off, severely censured. Um, and give warnings next time. Don't jump out and start the battle. So that's a story a local historian contacted me with. And it, it's just an amazing part of our history that I'm not too sure we were really taught a, a, about at school, a, about the lengths people would go to make money to get their whiskey into these yeah. big cities of, of Glasgow and of Edinburgh, of Aberdeen, and the, and the battles that happened as well. So an amazing um, part of the the story and that story tells me it all starts there. Yeah, I don't. I don't even think as, as people who are into whiskey and and learn the history of whiskey, we you know you, you learn the dates, you learn the acts and stuff, but things like that, you you don't oh. really, uh, you know, it's a fascinating, fascinating part of, of history. Uh, you, you what's, hear, what's, what's, yeah. What's more interesting yeah. is um, I don't have them to hand, but it's when you see the names and it was George Carmichael of Drimmon. These these are farmers and guys that were just trying to make extra money in the side by. Yeah. taking the smuggled contraband into Glasgow, which they did legally before that line was drawn between the 4th of Clyde and the 4th of Tay, you know? So yeah. it's just a ridiculous law which got wheaked off the books in 1823, as you know, with the Excise Act. It's scary, yeah. Um, so so you have, let's say, you, you before whiskey, you had a, a career in kind of comedy. Um, you did the Edinburgh Fringe. It was, it was yes. the Edinburgh Fringe. That was was that whiskey related? Was that a no, 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 no? no I have done the Edinburgh Fringe, and that's what led to my job as an experiential ambassador when right. I was a tour guide 
uh, went out uh, at Glen Goyne. I'd written a history of um, whiskey from 5,000 years BC to the present day, just as you do. My version of, of, of the all the facts and make it a bit of fun. And I, I delivered it around the, you know, country, doing little shows here and there. And then Glen Goyne said, could you do the same for the Victorian period? Um for our whiskey, we'll try and take it to the take it to the festival. So again, this was the genesis of the storytelling I've just been explaining. Yeah. So we did a small sort of Victorian sort of what the Victorians did for Glen Goyne, basically, and it was performed at the the festival sort of by myself with a variety of moustaches, hats, coats, and uh, you know antique Victorian walking canes, and. Um, so you did a tasting. There was four whiskies there, and there was four lovely, um, three whiskies there, sorry, and three small bites of food. And that was the Cantinis, if you know Edinburgh, at the Cannonball at the top of the Royal Mile, just mm -hmm. before the castle. Um, yeah, yeah. So it was a tasting. You sat down with your three whiskies on the tasting mat with a little bits of cheese and a little haggis. So it, all intents and purposes, it was a, a tasting. But then the lights went off, and we had projection mapping, uh, of the distillery with drone footage and um, then we started going back in time and then I come out as a Victorian dressed as a Victorian and do the do the um, tasting of the first whiskey which was a Victorian tasting which I thought would be very strict so if anybody was with you know sort of bare shoulders or you know their, their, their shirts were unbuttoned you know I'd be I'd be right on to them and um, so it's a bit of theatrical role play but I quite liked it get your button up you call that a dress I, you know um so I, I, and then we filmed Robbie Hughes the distillery manager um a few months earlier on a green screen so um I decided to go back to the Glen Goyne and so uh, there was a very clever fancy special, special effects I end up on the wall projected as the Victorian talking to the new manager Robbie mm -hmm. Hughes, so old manager meets new manager and they have a wee chat about the liquid. And then that's, so that was a sort of the Edinburgh Fringe show. And that was a great whiskey tasting, but just with theatricality and a bit of showmanship and a bit of special effects and uh, visuals thrown in there. It's called Unhurried. And we're hoping, hoping to do it some sometime in the future. Sounds amazing. Uh, Douglas is uh, to say it was great. Um... It only took, he also mentioned it only took you five minutes to mention Joanna Lumley. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> I, 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 I would hardly even mention that it was episode two, 26 minutes in. I mean, that would just cheapen <laughs> um, my name dropping there. So I wouldn't even mention that. But we'll say no more about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going so, to do, I mean, it's easy to see. Um, just just spending 20 minutes in, in this chat with you how how you can be involved in this kind of thing um and you, you've done you've got your whiskey unscripted uh podcast yes. um and you've got kickabout as well that's Is, finished now the, the kick about. That, that finished before i joined glen going right okay I'm, I'm yes. glad to say, I'm, we kind of so so for those who are, who are listening um gordon and i spoke about this briefly um a couple of weeks ago and then it was just today we thought yeah we're going to go ahead with it let's do it um so i was straight on the laptop but doing a little bit of research so so i apologize if my facts aren't 100 percent um but it's all not at all the scripted. kick about was uh, i used to work for talk sport and talk sport yeah. um opened up a station in edinburgh uh, to talk about mostly east coast leave the old firm for the, the the guys in london talk sport so this was a talk sport station um and it was mostly sort of any other football and I had the evening show which I turned into a bit of a comedy sort of knockabout and we called it the kickabout so yes yeah, it's great three years and it finished sadly the station closed very difficult now with uh, commercial radio in Scotland it's very difficult to make um, ends meet and I just took it online took took the, the, the football players Mickey Weir Joe Tortolano and we had a, a, a podcast so I was quite an early adopter of the, the podcast way back 2010 2011, um, again, trying to make any decent money a way back in those days was, was was tricky. So I think we got about a year out of it. But the downloads were amazing in those days. And um, that was great. I think we, I think the highlight of that podcast, the kickabout, was we, we, we got invited, um, because Mickey Weir's very friendly with Irvin Welsh, we got invited to the world premiere of the movie Filth um, oh. at, at the top of the 
right beside the playhouse, the Omni Omni Center. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we got the full full um, black ticket. It was in the main theater, watching the film in after show party with uh, McAvoy. What's his name? Um, yeah, James McAvoy. James McAvoy and uh, Irvin Welsh and myself and Tortellano and Mickey Weir and all that. So uh, that was the highlight of the podcast. We put that interview with Irvin Welsh in a nightclub two in the morning online, and of course we got tens of thousands of. Wow. Of hits and things, and so that was good fun. But you just, in the long term, it was difficult to um, to sustain. It's a shame the radio show was that it was great fun, a great time, yeah. um, talking football and talking sport for um, five yeah. nights a week for three years. It just sounds like a kind of thing, you know, it's, it's a once in a lifetime, or you know, let, let's just do it. You know, you, you don't think about it, you, 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 you chat, you've got that space, and you just talk about it. Then, and if nothing comes of it, then great, but obviously, it, it went. I know. It, Thousands and thousands uh, of people. So well, it was it. great. I, I love radio, and that was a great. It was one of the highlights doing the interview. Waited about six months to get the. Oh, everybody went for that job, you know. So, I just went down the line of comedy and nonsense, and thankfully, that's what they they, they thought would rather have that than another pundit or another journalist. Let's try and give this early evening talk show sort of interaction phone show. Let's give it to a person that's going to bring a bit of comedy to it. So. It was great, and and one of my again, I'm not going to talk too much about it, but one of the highlights was um, I phoned up a. I wanted to know more rather than the four four two and who scored what. I wanted to know a about Under Armour, you know, all that fancy compression. So we got the guy invented that on. I got the guy invented umbrellas, the only British umbrella manufacturer on. I was watching the golf and saw the umbrellas, and I thought, are we still making them? Phone them up. Uh, but the, the the best one I got was the Mitre designer. Do you remember old Moldmaster? That yeah, every head yeah. remembers getting picked on the thigh <laughs> with a mold master. It's a blue and orange bruise, yeah. <laughs> That's right. Remember, got- I can take out with the PE teacher and it's freezing cold. You're sitting, and then the mold master. So I phoned up Mitre and I said, um, Who designs the balls? Can we speak to? And it turns out this old gentleman who was quite near retirement age and he designed the mold master in the 70s. I've had the guy who designed the mold master on. And his daughter phoned up because nobody's ever had him on the radio before. And she phoned up and we had them talking. So it was ideas like that that I much like, much prefer to investigate rather than who scored the goal, wasn't a back four leaky, blah, 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 blah. You know, I want to know who designed the mold master. <laughs> so that was good fun. It's it's not too, well, I mean, obviously a high level, but that's that's the kind of thing we want to do with these wee bladders is, you know, the guys behind the scenes um, who, you, I mean, apart from yourself, obviously, who's quite used to being out in front of people. Um, but we're going to go a little bit behind and speak to bloggers and speak to, um, mm-hmm. in a couple of weeks, we've got Paul McLaughlin. I'm not sure if you heard of the Whiskey Doc. Um, yes. who, who's coming on. So, you know, not a lot of people in Scotland uh, know him. So, so these kind of insights and in, in different That's things. Exactly, so. exactly. You know, it's, it's just, yes, I, I love that idea. Just It's easy to go for the, you know, the new the release. Big- you know, but let's talk about it. There's the notes we get from the or, but just a little bit extra work to find out. You know, as you say, a little left of field that is important. Uh, but let's let's give them a, a little um, spotlight. And, you know, it's much more interesting yeah. for me. So we had uh, a wee while ago. We had Susan Allen uh, comment on saying that she watches you regularly on Whiskey and Scripted. Um, and, and just yes, yeah, I know Susan. You know, I don't know her, but seen her. Thank you. Yeah, so before we, we launched uh, Duncan Peter as well, uh, another guy who come who mentioned uh, whiskey and scripted. So Duncan, I hope you're watching as well. Um, oh. So so it would be yeah, you know, we, we can't not mention uh, whiskey and scripted. So tell us a little bit about it, um, the idea behind it, who you've had on, who you chat to, and uh, and where yeah. you see it going. The um the we wanted to do a podcast for a while, uh, but you know you're. But the job of God, it's, it's, it's quite busy, you know, especially with quite a lot of travelling. <laughs> Hang on, have a drink. <sighs> quite a lot of travelling. Um, but obviously when, when the events transpired, then I was quite quickly just asked if um, we could put the podcast on, we could get the voice out there and uh, talk, uh, you know, about Glen Goyne, Tam Do, but talk about whiskey. Because um, we're very keen not to have it on sort of aren't we great in-house um, sales pitch for our whiskies. Um, we wanted to be more inclusive and talk about whiskey in general, especially Scotch whiskey. So yeah, we had a couple of meetings with you know 
brands are, but my co-host, Gordon Dundas, um, who's the global brand ambassador and brand advocate, he's got quite um, a good influence at higher areas than I have in the company. So I think he smoothed things over. So it was great. We got the podcast up and running and um, we just called it Unscripted because we don't have a great deal of time. We do work. So we, we just get together like yourself. That's why I love this vibe, a lovely blether and a good natter. And um, we just put the, the, the podcast together. And one thing we wanted to do, because we are producers, um, we've got a little inside track. So we wanted to get people that make the whiskey on for an insider's guide, which, you know, would be quite useful. So, yeah, it's been quite nice. We've had the Cooper at Tamdu, who employed a, a, a Cooper in the last three years. I think it was Sandy up there employed John. Uh, uh, and Sean, I can't remember second name, apologies, Sean, but uh, Sean, come on, we'll have a wee chat about being a Cooper up in Tamdu and working at Craig Ellicky in the Cooperage there as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm sure Douglas will tell us the name soon. He'll, he'll pop up with the name. Oh, yes, that's right. I, 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 I know. So we've had, we've had people from our own company on to give us an inside track, but we've had, um, and I, I forget his name, I but, Big Gordon worked in in this for the whiskey magazine, worked in the States doing quite a lot of bourbons. So we had the gentleman on from uh, Pappy Von Winkle, which is quite a nice big name, who's yeah. the guy that's in charge of and Douglas will have to tell us his first name as well, because my memory, quite frankly, always forgets. And uh, John Campbell from Lafroy, the manager of yeah. Lafroy, with John on as well, which is great. We're all happy to um talk them up. So yeah. Ewan Mitchell, is it Ewan Mitchell from Arran? Had the Arran on as well, talking about lag and the new distillery down in south of the island. Yeah, yeah. We, so, um, I was lucky enough to, to get the Lefroy tour with uh, John. Uh, oh, God, that was two years ago now, uh, on the Isla Whiskey Academy. Oh, I uh, John was, you know, he, he could tell you where, where, how, how true it is or not, but I fully believe him. He could tell you where, which warehouse and which kind of area of the warehouse a cask could be just from from nosing and smelling tasting the cask uh, pretty incredible stuff yeah i know it's, it's fantastic so i've got lots of lots of um names on you know yeah. load, loads including john lumley popped up i'm actually asked her if she'd come on for a quick chat did that mean um uh, and i think another one and i've got it in one of the earlier first episodes um was a guy called john cashman who I think Gordon worked with at um, Morris and Beaumore. I think they worked together there. And John Cashman, is Gordon says, knows more about Irish whiskey than he, he, we've forgotten. He's just a, an amazing mine of information. And I was watching um, Secrets of the Factory with a chap from MasterChef, and John Cashman was on, like, hey, there, talking about Irish whiskey. So uh, it's amazing. I mean, just talking about, you know, do they all triple distill? Nope. You know, are yeah. they all pity? Nope. You know, you know, there's not um, all all these myths that need to be busted a little bit. John does that very well. So that was a very good interview. We've got lots of lots of people up there. So that's the idea. Talk about Scotch whiskey and the world of whiskey. Um, and I sort of, who, who was the uh, who was the rugby superstar you had on? I've got no idea, uh, Douglas. I've got no idea, Douglas. <laughs> Douglas Wiley has just popped up there. So, yes, that was Insider's Guide to, you know, selling the whiskey. It's one thing you talk about making all the time, but listen, you'll know Michael as well. More than anyone, it's, it's about selling as well. So I was quite, we're quite keen to get Dougie and uh, Danielle, who works for the East Coast and the West Coast side of Scotland, to get them on, to get their take on how actually they go about trying to get the whiskey to people like yourselves and, and what, you, how, what happens? What's the job? What's the gig? So that was quite a great episode as well. We decided to move it onto YouTube, which, you know, you would never think by my face it would actually be a thing. But yes, we're on YouTube now as well. So you can look at it and, or just download it. So it's been great fun. And we get together every 10, 12, 14 days and, and record it and throw it out there. Yeah, I, I did listen to. So during the lockdown, we um, we, we did local deliveries. So I was out in the country um, delivering uh, just in the Aberdeenshire area uh, looking for things to listen to. So I did listen to the first couple of episodes. Uh, and then I spent so much time having to 
to stop and put off the phone and, and update because we'd lose signal and we lost the maps and all that. And I thought, you know, I just can't focus on on that. So so I ended up having to stop. But I really I do want to get back into the because yeah. uh, you know, as soon as we mentioned that you were coming on, we, we had a lot of guys mention of oh, whiskey unscripted, and the, so you've you've obviously got a great following. Um, yeah, I think we've just got that just the last couple of weeks there, the ten thousand download on audio was quite nice. So I've got ten thousand downloads, and um, we've got a few hundred on on YouTube. You know, funny people want to listen more than watch us. I mean, you know, <laughs> I, I, can, I can quite understand why they're doing. But um, a, I, I try and I'll do it again. I went into the last few um, episodes and just tried to put the people that were on in the title. You know, so you can just choose because we get so many episodes now, 32, 34 episodes. Um, I thought I'll try and make the title a little bit more clear and transparent. Yeah. Who was on which episodes? So you can just pick and choose. We're not expecting people to listen to every one. So I'll try and work on that again. And if you're listening or watching this, um, you can go through Whiskey Unscripted and have a wee look at the and the John Cashman's or the Pappy Von Winkle, for example. These are great. And Tatsui as well up in... Um, the Highlander Inn was a yeah. great as well up, up, up there. He come on and Sandy McIntyre from Tamdu. You had the ten there. He he chatted. So there, hopefully in the titles you can go to the hosting site and there's a whole list of episodes and you can. Yeah. I think so. You know, I don't know, but I, I, I expect um, listening to things has become a lot more popular. Um, with, with people working at home, they'll be on their computer at home. They don't have to listen to the office radio. Uh, of what their boss wants to listen to, they they can choose what they want to listen to and have it, you know. So, so if you're into whiskey, what better to just have this? It might just be in the background, but I imagine people will have more choice over what they listen to themselves um, while they're doing their work. And yes, I think so. And I think you know, you're watching. Actually, your whole attention is taken up when you're watching something. But as you say, when you're listening, you can be out walking the dog. In fact, one of the first uh, emails I got was from a chap from uh, the, the states. <clears throat> Pete, Petey Pete as he calls himself, Petey Pete, uh, I think it was either walking the dog or on his bike, but he wanted, he, he didn't like the stereo because he always wanted one ear free. Um, so you could have one, and I understand that if you're not a biker, you're walking, you want one ear free. But if I've recorded the show in stereo, it means when Gordon's speaking, and I, you know, if you've only one ear and you can't hear the other, <laughs> yeah. so I had to work out how you make the podcast mono. So yeah, I record it in stereo, and then I've got to, um, change it into a mono file and then upload it and all do all sorts so that goes out as a mono file so we do listen to our uh, <laughs> listeners if they, if they write in and that was that was a very useful that's brilliant yeah you, you would never have thought of that no. it, unless no. somebody kind of brought that up yeah, it's... you know stereo you know it's like it's like saying that I would like my I'd like my telev television show in black and white please what are you talking about? Stereo is much better. Than, but yeah, I think a lot of people are one ear, you know, out with the dog or yeah. I think if you're on a bike, it's you know you you want to be able to hear traffic or whatever. So yeah, to get, get yeah. safety. So if you want to stay safe when you're biking, <laughs> right, get, get this unscripted downloaded. Yeah, that's the safest way to bike. I'm I say, I, I, I've, not, I've not put that in the sales pitch yet. You know, whiskey unscripted mono. <laughs> I don't know if I'd sell anymore, but. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. We're getting another couple of comments. We've got uh, Mark Westmoreland, um, making a team at the coalface, getting the brands into the hands of the consumer. Specs. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's uh, all these different angles, you know, and there's other, you know, angles in. The next angle, one of the other angles I'd like in is, you know, what happens to the whiskey that doesn't go in the bottle? We call it bulk spirit. And every distillery, if you want to make money, you want to sell your bulk spirit. So, we're working on that as well because that's another part of the industry we just well we just don't see. We are dealing with what's in the bottle. Yeah, but you, you, you know that's how you that's how you make your money. You don't bottle it. You don't have a marketing team. You don't have people selling it into people taking lots of cuts. It's the bulk. It's yeah. the spirit. You, you, you sell on, and that's that's, that's the part that try and work on that and a, a little bit of insider knowledge. We'll try and get that yeah. in the future. That sounds like an interesting conversation to have. Um, it probably deserves a, a full a full chat about it just on its own, doesn't it? I know. So yeah, it's it's you know, you say it's such a big part of the the unseen whiskey industry that not many people can consider or even 
Oh, I know. And, I, and it's still going on. And he, he, even if it's not just selling bulk, and it's, I, I really, it's well above my pay grade, but still quite a lot of swapping going on. You know, we'll take a par parcel of your yeah. whiskey, we'll give you a parcel of our whiskey. And it was just having a chat with, again, I mentioned Stuart Henry and Robbie Hughes already from Glen Goyne. And, and that was the reason why we had bourbon barrel matured Glen Goyne. Because a number of years ago, there was a few swap deals going on, and I don't know the company, I'll chase it up. We um, sold them some Glengoyne spirit. Mm -hmm. This company matured it, as they are very allowed to do, uh, then independently bottled it. But they'd matured it in bourbon barrels. And they brought it back to Robbie and Stuart and said, you a taste of your whiskey done in our bourbon barrels. And this was, I think, mid-2000s. And it was a revelation, like, my God, this is, this is, this is not bad stuff. We should maybe take this to Leonard. Leonard Russell owns a company and give him a taste of this. And it was a, you know, always been sherry matured whiskey, but you know, mm -hmm. let's let's have a go at that. And that's how the twelve was born. And then, of course, you know, the fifteen and now the legacy chapter two um, is there with the biggest amount of bourbon barrel matured whiskey we've got. So um, these stories and this idea of swapping is, is, you know, it can lead to places you'd never think it would yeah. have led to. So there's one. One of the few whiskies we have uh, in the house that's unopened is the Glengoyne 15 year old. Uh, when we were down at the distillery, uh, it was part of the tasting and it was Tony the wife's favourite. Um, but obviously, this continued um, and it we could. And I found it just the other, must have been a, last month, maybe the beginning of last month. I see, I, I found a shop, I had it, a couple of bottles left. So I bought one um, and gave it to her and she's like, in the cabinet. So we, we don't know when we're going to open it. Uh, I know, but it's, nice. it's you know she's more of a, a bourbon ca a, a, a peated cask fan, but yeah. uh, this this has been a standout for her. So she, we're uh, we're waiting for an occasion to maybe the first time. I, or, or I love that you found it in a shop. And there's only two left. It just reminds me of a story that one of our um, tour guides was actually a nurse. I think she's I think she's a golden jubilee. But I still remember that story when um, she went back to her school and they were doing a, a school summer fair. And then mm -hmm. the bottle, the bottle bank, she saw a Glengoyne 17 up on the, you know, it's one of these bottle banks. It was bottle, you had to get a raffle ticket, a five or a zero. A tabola. You know, and she saw a 17 Glengoyne in the top shelf. <laughs> She's like, how much did it? was 50p, I think. Here's 20 pound. I think it was even more. Can I get the bottle? And they gave her it, you know, for a good... So, yes, it's always worth having a wee... <laughs> yeah, perusal. Some of these lost whiskies. Oh, I, I don't remember when the the out of date iron brew and those kind of things. It's, <laughs> yes, you, you never win the, the good or, or sweetheart stout or something like that. It's, it's what I win, and you see great bottles of whiskey. Um, and then, the, here, you, you you might know. I, I'm not very convinced by his comment here. Uh, don't don't listen to the word he says from Gordon Dundas. Like, I've not a given good build up earlier on, so yeah, Gordon. Uh, yeah, he mostly just tuned in. He wasn't listening to what you had to say before. <laughs> so, it was so all good, good or so positive. Yeah. Yes, so, our whiskey yeah. unscripted co-host. <laughs> yeah, if you don't want us to listen to the good stuff he said about you, um, we'll, we'll we'll ignore that. That's fine. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so Gordon did our uh, Tam Do tasting um with the launch and it went down really well so are you are you involved with tam do at all are you solely glenn going or do you no, I, I i just put this on tonight because um i just thought we're talking glenn going but no i'm yeah. absolutely wonderfully involved with tam do in fact i've got a lovely little, <laughs> little there you go there oh well, there you go <laughs> it's an awful big key ring you know it's a what a pain that is taking that around the, the shops um no Sandy McIntyre, who's a manager at Tamdu, I think it was 2017, asked for the first time. It was just getting so popular, the Speyside Festival, and they were expanding the tours for the two days Tamdu's open. Asked for a couple of um, Glen Goyne tour guys to come up, and myself and Joanne um, answered the call. So we had to go up, I think it was early, early to mid January, and go up. Big Sandy. Sort of took us round and took us round. He's quite a character, Sandy. He's a very passionate man about Tamdu and about his distillery, and he will not let anyone, you know, let loose on the public without his, you know, absolute stamp of authority. So I, I was yeah. takes me quite a lot to get nervous, but 
you know, I think we had to go back up a few weeks later and then take Sandy on tour. Over. <laughs> but, uh, so, yeah, it passed off quite well and we did the 2017 um, Tamdu tours. And what's lovely, you know, is because it's, it's a working distillery. Even during the festival, it's uh, it's working distillery. Um, so it gives the guys a little bit more time to carry on working. I could take the public rounds. Um, and Sandy said, right, you take them round into the, the mill room, up to the mashing, into fermentation, see the washbacks, um, then down to the stills. You can stop at the production operative there, have a wee chat with them. Um, and he said, ask them what the uh, tack in the wall was it was a sort of calendar that wasn't meant to be seen by the public. He says, just embarrass them. Do the stills, and then I'll meet you in the warehouse, number one and number two warehouse somewhere, just for two minutes. So he set off, and the, the tours on the Friday and Saturday, and he set off, get to the warehouse, and think, where's Sandy? He's probably not here. He comes out, and then does a 20-minute masterclass with them all. You know, it's extraordinary. Not just once, but every tour. He's, he just can't keep away. It's like, Sandy! You know, you've got us up to do this. He's like, no, I, I, you know, I, I just need I just a wee chat with him. So <laughs> they get the tour and then they get Sandy, uh, which you can't beat. So, yeah, I've lovely. I've, and then 2018 and 2019 uh, doing the same thing at Tamdu, taking people around on it this. Working under somebody so hands on and, and involved, though, you know, because you, you do get, uh, let's not name names, but you do get distilleries where we try and get in touch with about a tour or whatever. And it has to go so far up the chain, and sometimes that chain jumps continents. Yeah, so, yeah. so having somebody who can make decisions and, and be be involved and in, in kind of almost, almost yeah. wait just to, to give people experience, it's it's outstanding. That to me um, is is what whiskey is all about. It's giving unique whiskey experience, and and I think experience is very key, which is why when I see an experiential manager, I thought. Uh, yeah, this guy's got it. He know he know, understands what it's all about. It's it's I, very I, yeah. nice. And what's very nice, uh, Mike, that uh, that's basically a family business you're talking mm. about there, really. You know, it doesn't go across continents. It goes to uh, the very highest level. It goes to Leonard Russell, who owns the company. And mm -hmm. um, we've mentioned about the fence, the festival, Edinburgh Fringe. Leonard Russell came along with his wife and his kids. Tom now has joined the company. as a fourth generation uh, Russell in the company. They came to the festival show. Now, if you think I was nervous uh, doing the tour in front of Sandy, I, you know, at the Edinburgh Festival, I, I looked out, I thought, oh, my God, Russell's uh, Leonard's in, and he's in with his wife, you know, and he's not been drinking, he's sober, uh, which he always is, of course. But I was hoping he might have come in with some business colleagues after a, a few drinks at work, but no, uh, which was lovely, and afterwards couldn't be nicer, and then a few months later, um, they put the job out for tender, but that was the job I got, was to take that yeah. idea and just make it a reality as a proper job as it were yeah. so it was great you've got the owner there chatting to you it's, it's, uh, that's what makes i think family businesses and e mcleod a little bit special yeah and, and it's it's obviously i mean we, we're here talking about whiskey we, we have to touch on to the uh the pig's nose and the sheep dip and and kind of oh, yes. some lesser known uh the brands that you do uh we, we took in actually just for the first time we don't have a huge blended range but we we brought it in at the turn at just the end of last year so uh and they're, they're going well you know it's it's getting people to try them i think is is the hardest part there is a little bit of snobbery about single malt but once yeah. they try whiskey and try whether it's blend blended malt single malt you know once they try it and, and the price point that some of these guys are at you know it's a no-brainer that they it's great fun it's great fun i mean who calls you know whiskey a pig's nose yeah. <laughs> you know, smooth. I mean, it's just, it's just fun, and, and 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 you know, it's a lovely. You know, when it gets warmer, if you're watching this out with Scotland's, you know, maybe it is warm there, but when it gets warmer, <laughs> that pig's I nose. Know I know we're, we're we're doing a really high strength whiskies to keep warm, but the pig's nose with a with a, a high ball with some ginger ale or some soda there with some ice. What a lovely drink! Or even as a base of a cocktail, drink it on its own, obviously. But it's such just like it's a fantastic drink and the sheep dip blended malt just absolutely delicious full stop mm -hmm. yeah yeah and, and as i said you know the price point of, when you get that into somebody's hand in a glass and, and that's something that we miss is yeah pour it in the shop we don't do kind of in-house tastings at the moment 
but uh, you know, when you pour a dram and let somebody taste it, it's it's sold. You know, it, yes. it didn't matter whether it was a, a grain or a single malt, a blend, whatever. People taste it and they like what they taste. Um, which is why these virtual tastings that we we've been doing quite a lot, we'll, we'll have fun. Um, if you're just tuning in, we've got Glen Goyne virtual tasting on the sixth of May. Uh, with election Gordon. night, election night, yes. Oh, election night. You know, there's there's two reasons to remember it. Um, Gordon Dallas and and Glen Goyne whiskey are the two reasons. Um, there's there's something else on as well. But, uh, uh, yeah, uh, so we've opened up to to so many different people um, with with these virtual tastings and getting drink into people's hands that they maybe you know if you if you if they looked on their shop website and said oh there's a a Glen Goyne tasting at the shop in their tasting room, uh, but I tried the 10. It was good, but, you know, whatever. I won't go. But if you are sending it out to them, a lot more people are saying, yeah, l- let's experience that. It's you know, it's almost not adventure, nothing again. They're sitting in the house. And the amount of tasting, we, we did not believe how many of these we'd be doing when we started off um, a year ago. We're, we're now doing six to 10 a week uh, of these tasting. It's, it's incredible how that has opened up the market. And and I'm not talking people in, in Edinburgh, London, Switzerland, Norway, you know, which we are saying. And you're, you're talking about people in Inverurie, where we're based, who are, are just on the outskirts, who aren't willing to pay or, or, or can't afford to pay, whatever the reason, £10 in a taxi to do a detention and £10 back. That's 20 quid on top of the taste. And, you know, they're just, so now, now it's, a couple of quid in the post or, or we'll deliver it. Um, I fully understand that. Yeah, how do you feel that this virtual is going to go? Uh, do you think it's here I, to stay? I think mm-hmm. so. I, I think so. And I think, um, well, I, 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 whatever the word will be, it'll be blended virtual tastings um, where you will be, have people live, but you can stick a camera in the corner and people can join us, you know, from around the world. So we can send them tasting kits. So it's, there's a bit of both going on. I don't think this will ever leave us. And I think you've written off. Sometimes who wants to go into the colds, into the sort of dark night? You can just get your whiskey delivered and still have a great experience. And, you know, you maybe pick and choose your evenings you want to go out. But I think it's great fun. I think it's just, it's just good fun. And as you say, you're not losing a, a great deal by getting a tasting kit and having something different. Whereas you travel um, miles and miles and miles, you want to go for the thing that you absolutely want, as opposed to taking a wee punt on a kit and having a laugh. So, yeah, I think they're, they're, they're really here to stay. And what form they finally land on, I, I'm, not, I'm not too sure. And we just talked earlier on about podcasts. Um, you know, who thought, Radio would be here in the year 2021. I was maybe one of the first podcasts way back after the radio station in 2010, 2000. That was a big, big podcast time. But I thought it was dead by 2015 as well. But there is, they're back again. So, yeah. you know, I, I think this will find its own feet, but I don't think it's going anywhere. No, no, certainly not. And, and I, do, I do want to just emphasize when I use Glen Going 10 year old as an example there, I've never had anyone taste it and think, no, that's not good. <laughs> it was just because we're in Glengoy mode that that was the first whiskey came out of head. So, so just emphasize. <laughs> uh, and we we sold. Um, it, it's it's before the watershed, but we sold a lot of it. Um, yes, and it, it did very well for us. Uh, so, you know, if you if you are intrigued about Glengoy and you're watching, you'll, it, it's a great introduction to the to the brand. It's a lovely, yeah. you know, it's a really fresh, clean, I would say, pre-dinner on the patio drink, you know, either on its own or make it long. Just a really refreshing dram. So it's, uh, it's I think it comes into its own in summer, the, the Glen Goyne 10. Yeah, yeah. I would certainly agree. I, I first experienced it in, in January, um, which was... It was actually quite a mild journey. It's very similar to the weather we have here um, just now, when I first started uh, my Glen Goyne journey uh, uh, back in, it was only 2019. I had had it in bars. Um, yep. The the 15 year old we, we had, um, I've, I've got a bar as well, which unfortunately closes now, but we, we, we had the 15 quite regularly, um, but I never tried the 10. And, and when you start on the 15, it, it's quite a, it, it's yes. hard to, 
it, I wouldn't say a step down, but psychologically, you think it's a, it's a great drama, a great price. I think the 15 was about 50 pounds, 55 yeah, pounds. Yeah. Um, um, you know, and now, now a lot of the time you struggle to get a, a good 10 or 12 year old for that. I'm the same. I've, my my story is very similar. When I joined, I, you know, I, I've got, in my class, I've got an 18. And when, you know, you, you get a chance, I was on the 15s. I've got, I've got 21 back there, got some of the teapots as well. And it was that fringe show when I was doing in the afternoon. And we're, you know, three whiskeys. And I thought the cask strength, I can't be drinking that. There's two shows a day. I can't be drinking the whiskeys, you know, in two shows. I can only have a little soup song. Uh, uh, at the you know between shows, it's just a little one, and I thought I'll just do the ten forty percent ABV, and you know it really that was twenty eighteen. I had tasted it, of course, but that really opened my eyes to the ten, you know, and yeah. um, never look back. It's because I, I always have a, a, a bottle of it, and sometimes if you ask me, would you have one bottle of twenty five or four or five bottles of ten year olds? <laughs> I, I like my whiskey, so I think you know yeah. the answer. <laughs> yeah, I, I would probably have the same answer. I think I'm pretty sure. So, um, I mean, that, that's us kind of hit the the hour mark. Um, I mean, guys who are watching, if you've got any questions, um, we're, we're probably just a way to wrap up. But um, just as we do, feel free to find any questions in. Um, but Gordon, thanks very much. Um, like I said, we, we just kind of. So thank you on this today. Um, so I really appreciate you taking time out. Um, and if the wife wants to send me a bill for for the painting job, it's not going to get oh, no. done. I know. It's, 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 it was it was a night. It's a haul today. Uh, paint. Everybody's been there. That watery paint. Oh, it's just you know. So it's, and yesterday it was gardens and gardens. So no, this is. I'm, I was delighted when you said we can still do this tonight. I'm like, you know what? Back down to the office with a whiskey. <laughs> and talk whiskey, I'll be there. So I, mean, I, I can't wait to the the the, the May tasting as well. Yeah. It's fun. It's it's a it's a great lineup. Um, what have we got? We've got the ten, the twelve, the legacy, the the eighteen, and the cask strength. Are the the drums we've got on online for that? Um, and and you've got a real cheap the legacy too. Sorry, Mike. Uh, the leg okay. real cheap. If you're a fifteen fan. If you remember the 15, or even if you're a 12 year old uh, Glen Goyne fan, the Legacy 2, you know, has got 40, almost 50% first fill bourbon barrel matured whiskey. And um, yeah, but another 12% American oak. So American oak is the big star of that drama. It's, it's uh, something to look forward to. Awesome. So we've got David Muir, who is a relatively new customer to us in Maruri, but um, it's fast becoming one of our, our best and favourite guys. Uh, he, <laughs> I'll give you a quote. Um, I'm, I'm, he said three, but I'm sure it might be a whiskey involved. But, uh, of course. Is that right. I'm sure we could do a deal. We could do a deal, then. <laughs> oh, I know. I know. Well, are you, are you, Hopefully. A couple of guys mentioned at the start um, about that you've been in the sauna. Is, it, is this what this room originally was? Or is, no, was, I'll, just, oh. I'll just move up. There's a, the camera, I've got one of these cameras that follows me. So. Yes, it's a, basically it's a garden shed that I got insulated when I was working in radio. I needed some place to record the wee sketches I did and nobody ever saw it until last year when Zoom arrived and we were doing with Gordon Dundas, I think it was the first, I was either a Tam Do or a Glen Goyne tasting and I'd left my heater on by mistake. So the combination of seeing wood panelled walls here and my face going redder and redder and I was a bit too nervous to start bending down to turn things off. People started to text in What's he doing in a sauna? And, you know, <laughs> that really looks, looks like a very hot sauna. And, and it just suddenly my recording studio or my office suddenly was cheapened to the sauna, which sounds quite seedy. But, yes, it's at the bottom of my garden and it's a garden shed. Got a bit of electricity and a bit of insulation. So, and it's where right. I, 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 I like to drink the whiskey away from decorating the house. Quite right. Because it's work, obviously. You're, you're, it's your office. You're working. Thank you. Thank you. That's see. You understand. <laughs> <laughs> and people, people don't know, but right, right behind the camera, I've got the uh, the wife who's giving me the looks now. It's uh, this is not work. You're not working here. But uh, <laughs> it, uh, it, it's it's a passion for the job. It makes us work these long hours and and hard no, hours. Got, um, technically on holiday this week, but there was a tasting on Tuesday. I wanted to do this, and it's a tasting tomorrow. And I just don't, 
you know, I enjoy them, you know, and, and, and it's, yeah. it's not avoidance. Do you hear that? It's not avoidance. <laughs> so um, it's it's just passion for your work. <laughs> yeah, I completely agree. And and, and all the, the guys who, who love whiskey uh, watching, I'm sure will agree with them as well. It's a hobby that you love and everyone says you have to have a hobby. Um, that, as long yep. as you do it sensibly, guys. Uh, yes, I just love it. As you see, there's, there's, there's movies about it, there's documentaries about it. There's uh, podcasts. There's uh, if you like your football, which I do. There's teams, different teams out there. All the distilleries are like a team. You've got the manager, and you've got all the different sort of players, or all the different expressions as well. So you can just go into another level. And if you look at the books behind me, I love my uh, history. So I've got a lovely um, these lovely books. You can delve right into the historical aspects of whiskey as well. That's another angle, another level that you can enjoy whiskey on. And I. Um, really lost a bit, best part of four or five years just studying the history of whiskey and getting right into all the um, where it came from and all the funny characters that inhabited it and I'll just sit down in my camera for <laughs> what? So that was it. So there's lots of levels. I said, get down me, man. <laughs> know your place. <laughs> Well, God, um, it's been an absolute pleasure, um, I, and I cannot wait until uh, May. It would be outstanding to have you up in the in the tasting room. I think May is going to—it's just too soon oh. um, for that. But but sometime maybe over the summer or into the the tail end of the year, um, I'd love to bring you up to the shop and uh, oh. we'll do something. And, uh, and vice versa, come on down. I'd love to take you around Glen Goyne and show you the distillery again, or even that yeah. storytelling experience that we talked about at the beginning. Yeah, um, I would love to. And the, this dram is is every bit as good as I remember it. Great. I mean, it's been that good. You know, for me, a dram that you don't even have to taste, you can just smell, is outstanding. I've, I've hardly had much from the pour. It's just you just want to smell it, and it's outstanding. So, That's, yeah. it's, it's, it's great. There's always a different single cask, a cask of the moment. Um, yeah. And if you, we we did a couple now of Facebook live events, but it was actually was it. December. I do apologise for the month. For Gordon and Das, Robbie Hughes, Blair Bowman, and uh, Chris from the Whiskey Magazine, um, and I forgot her name from the Errol Erskine. Um, did chose a cask from the the warehouse. There was four to choose from. Did a live tasting of each single cask and released it as the cask of the moment. And that is when the shop opens. The cask that you can pour to your own bottle. We did a second one, which is the Madeira cask, which is behind me as well. So these lovely single casks are just amazing. Just another angle, another facet to uh, the distillery into Glen Goyne is a, a, a single cask. But yeah, that was the, the, it's just a lovely way of delivering the message. You can do it on Facebook, do it on YouTube, get people to vote. But they, we sent them the whiskey kits of all the single casks. So they sampled yeah. them all. You know, do you want the bourbon barrel mature, do you want the refill, do you want the Madeira cask, or do you want the port cask? All fully matured from start to finish. And what a night that was. Um, and they voted for the, the port cask. But we've now, that, that's sold out. And now they've um, got a very rare Madeira cask, single cask, fully matured in Madeira cask. And it's now the cask of the moment. And there's only two Madeira casks. One's now been bottled and one's still at Glengoyne. So it's hugely rare. So it's on the, the website, I believe. Won't be many left if there is. In fact, no, they're sold out. Just, they're sold out. So oh, well, well, just, one, one, two, oh, but it's just amazing. It's a lot, I'm, I'm glad you're enjoying that, Mike. Yeah, outstanding. Um, as has tonight's chat. I've, I've really enjoyed it. It's been a great insight to not just Glen Goyne and a little bit of time to do, but um, yourself as well. Um, and like I said, I cannot wait until May. Um, so Love and marriage. We covered the mitre mold master. If you've missed it, you must go back and listen to it as well as smuggling the 19th century and John Lumley. So, not a bad. I've quite enjoyed it. It's been all right, isn't it? It's uh, I've been a whirlwind hour and ten minutes. But, uh, thanks very much, uh, guys. Uh, thanks very much for watching. Um, next week we have got uh, Charlie Chamonix from Whiskey and Freedom uh, blog over in Norway. See, so she's going to join us for our wee chat, and uh, Russell will be back. Um, he's he's getting spoiled by his wife tonight. Um, that, that, that's all I'm allowed to say on that. So yeah, that's why he's not here. So uh, hopefully you guys are having a good night. Um, enjoy the rest of your weekend. Uh, Gordon, or raise a glass. Slanjava.
Slangevar, Slangevar, folks. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you in Inverurie, and it might. But most importantly, I'll see you on May the sixth for May some six. order, order <laughs> on the night of the election. That'll be great fun. That'll be great fun to join us and see what's happening in the background. It's so, almost like fight night, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be awesome. I'm really looking forward to it. So yeah, Slangevar, folks. Cheers, guys. Bye bye.